good evening, everybody, and welcome. This is our first summer event for 2011. Uh, it's great to see so many new faces, and it's uh, super great to see so many old faces. You seem to enjoy coming, and we love having you. Um, just for your information, if anybody would like coffee, didn't get any, or if anybody is in the mood for a cherry sundae, just raise your hand, and somebody will bring you what you want. This is <laughs> of those two things. <laughs> Well, this is our second year of activities. Uh, last summer, we addressed um, the Frogtown Art Gallery, Nelson Shopping Center, historic Bailey's Harbor postcards, and our last, um, our last event was sort of an explanatory educational event on historic architectural surveys and why they're important and why we would like Bailey's Harbor to get one. This summer, our plans include tonight, a big kickoff event for the McArdle family. Um, there's a presentation of a four-generation family farm and orchard. The Croas Orchards is going to be done in June. Uh, we'll be exploring the history of the August Shram Building, which is now the Harbor Fish Market and Grill in July. And in September, we plan a program on, uh, again, sort of a a semi-educational thing on uh, learning how to do oral histories, which might be of interest to a lot of you. Um, Christy has schedules that she'll sort of just, you know, give each row a little pile. Oh, you had them out? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, you told me to do that. Okay. Um, now, there's a card with event dates also at the membership table. And now I must make an appeal. See, all things are going to be for money, but it's not. Um, we are very interested in collecting um, information on the Bailey's Harbor 4th of July. You know, it's been, we've been celebrating this for well over 100 years in Bailey's Harbor. And we have some interesting uh, pictures from 1909. We've just gotten some wonderful video uh, from Clayton and Pat Megenberg's collection. And I know that between 1909 and the 70s, there has to be stuff out there. So, you know, if you think about it, if you've been in town for that holiday, if you have something you share with us, we'd appreciate it. And you don't have to give up your stuff. Uh, we're very happy to scan it and digitize it and just put it in the Historical Society records. So uh, think about that and who knows? I mean, if, you're, if you had a business and you had a float and you have pictures of floats, anything like that would be fun to have. People will enjoy it. Um, if you'd like to join our Historical Society, and I hope everybody who's here will be just dying to join the Historical Society by the end of the evening. Uh, we have membership forms at the back, and uh, our treasurer, Mary Moran, is eager to take your money and give you a membership card on the spot. Our uh, levels of membership are for individuals, it's $15 a year. For a family, $25. For a business, $50. And you can parlay any of those into a lifetime membership for $150. Uh, we would love to see 10 new members tonight, so we're crossing our fingers. There are also volunteer opportunities. Um, we're trying to branch out a little bit and get more people involved. And there are sign-up sheets for those on the back tables. Um, the areas that we have out there, but doesn't mean there aren't more, include membership, you know, uh, keeping track of membership, generating membership, a publicity committee, research. Might, you might have your own research idea. Maybe you would be willing to help someone else. Uh, fundraising, and then preparing for events like this. Any questions from anybody that I should clarify about any of that? Good. Now, tonight our program is being presented by Chris Shore. She is one of the great-grandchildren of James and Anne McArdle, who emigrated from Ireland in the 19th century to Bailey's Harbor. She has been working on a genealogy of the McArdle family and uh, that's long strip is 
the genealogy that she brought with her today. Uh, she has many other works, and I know other people have brought things too. Uh, I'm not sure of their names, but all along these tables are memorabilia connected with the McArdle family. She's also written a brief biography of Michael McArdle, who donated this library, this town hall, the library, donated the Catholic Church in town, built Maxwell and Bray's. And if you're interested in having a copy of that, um, it's on the table over here, and you can get information in the front cover so that you're able to order it if you'd like to have it. It's, uh, it's a very neat little book. Chris, and, Chris was born in Door County um, and moved away at an early age. She has repatriated herself, and she and her husband, Jim, currently live in Bailey's Harbor up in the beautiful woods on the bluff. So um, I guess without any further chatter, I'd like to introduce her to you. Come on, Chris. Okay. Thank you, Leanne. You are welcome, and we're really excited to see this. I have to put my glasses on so we can all see. And she did mention the table over here. So there's a lot of books, a lot of albums afterwards. Feel free to go through them, open them up, look and see what's in them, because there's some really interesting things. Cad Milafalcha. That means 100,000 welcomes in Celtic. This is the story of the McArdle family. The McArdle family story begins in County Louth. County Louth is in the northeast corner of Ireland. Though it may be the smallest county, Louth features predominantly in Irish history and mythology. Louth was part of the ancient kingdom of Oriel, and many of the tales of the ancient Cúchalán are based in and around the county. There are a number of important religious sites in Louth, most notably Armanansterbos, which contains some of Ireland's most impressive high crosses. And you'll see a picture of one here. And you do find these all over Ireland. <coughs> Excuse me, these date back to the fifth century. The main towns of the county are Dundalk, which is an industrial hub, and the historic town of Drogheda, on the banks of the River Boyne. Drovida's tragic place in Irish history was sealed in 1649 when Cromwell besieged the city before massacring its 3,000 inhabitants. Enough of a brief history of Ireland. The McArdles were farmers and lived in the countryside north of the city of Dundalk. We visited there several years ago and spent a few days in the area. The McArdle home was located near Ravensdale, which you'll see just north of the little pointer there, and in the area and called the Lordship of Bally McCallet. And our grandfather always said, Bally McCallet, where the sun shines on it. I didn't know much of Ireland ever had a lot of sun shining on it, but apparently that one did. The only indication that we had found that we were in Ravensdale was that we came upon St. Mary's Church, rectory, and the cemetery. We toured the church and found a stained glass window with the McArdle family on it, and many of the graves in the cemetery with the name McArdle. The one that we show here was one of the newer ones. The other ones you couldn't read the names on, but there were several in there. The area is very rural with lots of farming. The countryside is rather hilly, and similar to the beginning of the foothills with farms scattered about. A lively pub called Lumpers was about a half mile east of us on Ravensdale Road T-174. We stopped in for a point, pint and to inquire where was Bally McCallot, and a gentleman sitting at the bar turned around and looked at me and he says, Mom, you're in the middle of it. <laughs> so, we inquired if anyone knew the McArdle family and we were told that the pub had previously been owned by the McArdles. They weren't available at the time, so we had our pint and were on our way. Our time was limited, so we really didn't have much time to do more investigating. James McArdle was born in Bally McCallot in 1826. His father was Michael McArdle, and his mother was Margaret. 
A record at St. Mary's of Ravensdale indicates that James was baptized on December 24, 1827. He did have a brother, Patrick, who came to Bailey's Harbor for a while and then returned to Ireland. And we've not found any records at this time of other children in the family. Michael McArdle was a farmer and most likely was a tenant farmer in the Lordship of Ballymacallit. At that time, it was very difficult for Catholic families to own their land. James worked on the family farm as a young man. As stated in the commemorative biography record, James was reared in the usual manner of a farm lad, giving his father the benefit of his services during his minority. His mother, Anna Fagan, was born in Ireland in 1838. We believe her family originated in County Meath, which is just to the south of County Louth. Her baptismal records of 1839 indicate that she was baptized at St. Mary's of Ravensdale, so the Fagan family was in that area. Anne's father was Patrick Fagan, and her mother was Mary White. We know that Anne had a brother, John, and at least one other sibling. James and Anna were married February 25th, 1865, at St. Mary's of Ravensdale. Their witnesses were Felix McCain and Mary Goss, which is a name that you'll hear around Bailey's Harbor. James continued to work on his family's farm and also did some bookkeeping. Their oldest daughter, Mary, was born in 1865 and baptized at St. Mary's on December 13, 1865. Her sponsors were James McDermott and Eliza Rice. At this time, many young families from the area were emigrating to the United States, and I'm sure that had a big influence on James and Nancy's decision to follow. Incidentally, Annie was always known as Nancy. We're not sure why, but he, Grandpa always called her Nancy, and that's what she went by here. Um, James and Nancy decided that it was time to follow some of their friends. In 1866, James left his wife and his young daughter in Bally McCallot to establish a start for them in the United States. He lived and worked in Troy, New York, and was soon able to bring Nancy and young Mary over to join him. Their second daughter, Elizabeth, Eliza, was born in 1868, and their first son, Patrick, was born in 1870 while they were living in Troy, New York. In 1871, the family packed up all their possessions and left New York for Bailey's Harbor, Wisconsin. They would be welcomed to Bailey's Harbor by several other families that left Bally McCallock and the Dundalk area before them. Reynolds, Walsh, Cody, Carmody, McNally, Collins, McDermott, Cassidy, Carr, McNeely, Goss, Fitzgerald, McCullough, Kinsella, Cornell, Muckian, Sullivan, and Quinn are some of the names of the Irish families that were already in the area. And you'll still find many of those families here in the, in the Bailey's Harbor area. When they arrived in Bailey's Harbor, they stayed with friends from Ireland, John and Catherine Burns Collins, and their family for a time. James had been able to save enough money while working in Troy to purchase a 40-acre tract of cleared land across from the Collins home on the east side of the main road, which is now Highway 57. This land you'll find still here now is at the very south end of hole number 11 beyond the new condos where their mound system sits is where the family started their, uh, their, had their first home. They built their very modest frame home on this property and farmed the 40 acres. And you'll see on the note, the first part of the house was way over to the left side. It was just the small one-story part uh, of, the, of the house at that point. Son Michael McArdle noted in his writing that originally there was no porch on the front. Two-by-two -two studdings projected into the room with wallpaper between the studs. Cleats were nailed across the studs to form a ladder to reach the attic where the children slept. There was only one small window up there. 
The entrance was to the west with a door and two windows facing the road. The other rooms were built on as the family grew and their means allowed. As noted again in the commemorative biography reference, in reference to James, he has entirely devoted himself to the development of the farming interests of his town and is now the possessor of one of the best farms in the vicinity. James added to his first land purchase over the years and by 1895 owned over 350 acres of timber and farmland. This property is now part of Maxwell and Brace in Bjork Linden. James and Nancy's family grew along with their holdings. Thomas was born in 1872, Michael in 1874, John in 1875, James J in 1878, and Anna in 1882 for a total of eight children. The children all worked on the farm and attended school in Bailey's Harbor. Again, the commemorative biography states that James has not only prospered in business, but has also secured a pleasant home and gained many warm friends, for his life has been a straightforward one, deserving of the esteem of those who knew him. The McArdle family raised horses and small livestock and chickens on their farm. The cattle grazed the property from Lake Michigan to Kangaroo Lake. The children were in charge of bringing them home. The farmland provided feed for the animals as well as grain for the family. It was said James was a good trader of cattle and horses. Their income came from trading and bartering, selling milk, butter, and eggs door to door as well as produce from their garden. My grandfather told, them, told also that they had the best sulky racing horse in the area. And this is our, his son, Pat, driving the horse. The McArdles were members of St. Mary of the Lake Catholic Church. By 1874, 20 families made up the Catholic congregation, and Father Rody came from Anape, Algoma, and said Mass once a month. With Father Rody's guidance, this small but devoted group built a 80 by 20 foot church with a 30 foot bell tower in Bailey's Harbor. It was noted that James McArdle Sr. and Martin Schramm Sr. mortgaged their farms to help defray the cost. Only through the generosity and free labor of all of these families was St. Mary's of the Lake established. This was the first Catholic church built in this part of Door County. Nancy's brother, John Fagan, followed his sister and brother-in-law several years after they settled here. John then moved to Montana to mine gold in the vicinity of Helena with his mining partner, Tommy Cruz. I don't know if it's any relations. <laughs> in his later years, he lived in San Francisco, California, where he built a parsonage for a church there. He quote, lived out his days here in Bailey's Harbor on the farm with Nancy and James, and he's buried in the family plot at St. Mary's. The McArdle Fagan children, of course, we said there were eight of them. First was Mary McArdle. As noted earlier, she was born in December 11th, 1865 in Ballymacallit, Ireland and she and her mother made the trip to the United States alone to meet James. Mary lived in Bailey's Harbor until she married Patrick Short on February 4th, 1893. The Short family was also Irish immigrants living in Bailey's Harbor since 1890. The senior Short family moved to Volan, South Dakota in 1894 and Mary and Patrick followed. In 1903, they moved to Aragon, Wisconsin, which is just north of Crandon. They had eight children, James, John, Dennis, Thomas, Elizabeth, Anne May, Margaret, and Rose. Patrick passed away in 1838 in Aragon, and Mary in September of 1953 at the age of 87. Their second daughter, Elizabeth, or Eliza, was born in Troy, New York on September 6, 
1868. <laughs> Excuse me. Liza married Fred Writings on October 3, 1894. Fred was the son of James and Matilda Chatter Writings, who lived just to the south of the McArdles in Bailey's Harbor. James and Matilda sailed from Liverpool, England in 1866 and came directly to Bailey's Harbor, where Matilda's parents were living. As a young man, Fred learned the blacksmith trade and settled in Ellison Bay. Liza and Fred lived in Ellison Bay until 1922 when they moved to Argonne, Wisconsin. They operated a store and gasoline station there for six years and then moved to Sturgeon Bay. And there's a picture over on the wall that Stephanie brought that has advertisements for their store. They had a summer home on Kangaroo Lake, not far from Liza's birthplace. Elizabeth passed away in Sturgeon Bay, October 27, 1960, at the age of 81. Eliza and Fred had four children, Anne, Mary, Harry, and Leona. And just as a side note, the next time you're in the Blue Ox, there's a picture of Fred Writings shellacked into the top of the bar. <laughs> Daughter Anne was born in Ellison Bay. She married Arthur Long in December of 1920. They had two daughters, Mary Jane and Jeanette. Mary Jane and her husband, Hugh Cammon, had a summer home out in Moonlight Bay. Anne and Arthur lived in Sturgeon Bay on Michigan Street. Mary was born August 12, 1898 in Ellison Bay and married Clifford White of Manistee, Michigan. They had three children, Byron, Bobby, and Judy. And just as a note, Judy's son, Don Kraut, would later manage Maxwell and Brace for the Writings family. The third child was Harry. And many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with our dear Harry Writings. He was a well-known Bailey's Harbor resident. He was born June 5, 1905, in Ellison Bay. Harry graduated with honors from Marquette University in Milwaukee with a degree in public relations. He married Lois Davis in 1938. After Michael McArdle's death, Harry was contracted by the family to manage Max Welton Brace in January of 1938 for $50 a week. Harry served in the U.S. Army Artillery during World War II, and when he returned, he offered to purchase Max Welton Brace, and then he became the sole owner in 1946. In 1948, Harry arranged for Max Welton Brace to host the Los Angeles Rams for a two-week training camp session. Goalposts were set up on hole number 11, and the fairway also served as a landing strip. The course was also the home of the Wisconsin Open for several years in the 1940s. Harry and Lois made their home on the resort property until 1983 when they moved into the condos that were built to the south end of the Max Welton property. Harry semi-retired and hired his nephew, Don Kraut, to manage the resort under his guidance. In his later years, it was not unusual to see Harry checking the course in the morning, driving around in his Jaguar. Nice golf cart. <laughs> Harry passed away at home February 9, 1993. Harry and Lois have one daughter, Michelle, who married Dick Heald, a Bailey's Harbor native. In 1999, an earlier sale to Mr. Kraut was dissolved and the Writings family again retained ownership of Max Welton. Michelle's daughter, Stephanie Heald Fisher, assumed management of Max Welton for her grandmother. Incidentally, Stephanie noted that the goalposts from the training camp were still in the green maintenance building at the course. The resort was sold in 2002 to a group of local businessmen. Their fourth child, Leona, was born also in Ellison Bay, married John Chole, and they had five children, Suzanne, JP, Mary Sue, Nancy, and Fred. Leona passed in, away in Milwaukee in 1967. Nancy and James' third child was Patrick, who also was born in Troy, New York. 
Patrick married Anastasia, or Nettie Smith, whose parents, the Kasmer Smiths, were from Posen, Germany, and now lived in the Polish settlement just outside Bailey's Harbor. Patrick delivered mail by horse and buggy or sleigh to each of the Northern Door communities. According to the 1920 census, he operated a tavern across from the Catholic Church. They had three children, Francis, Mary, and John. After Nettie's untimely death, Patrick struggled to keep the family together. He moved to the Crandon area to work cutting timber for his sister Mary and Patsy Short. Daughter Mary went to live with her uncle Thomas in Milwaukee, and the boys were at St. Aloysius Boys Home and Institute. Patrick later moved to Sturgeon Bay, then to Green Bay, and he passed away in Green Bay in April of 1957 at the age of 87. The fourth child of James and Nancy was Thomas, who was born in Bailey's Harbor in 1872. He was a marble polisher in Milwaukee. He married Kate Stralo, a widow from Milwaukee. Kate owned a saloon in downtown Milwaukee, which they operated, and they served the first free lunch at their tavern. And he and Kate were foster parents to his niece. Thomas passed away in Milwaukee. Are you missing a few? You gotta catch up. <laughs> this is the Patrick McArdle family wedding picture. And then you can do Thomas. And this is Thomas. And over here is Thomas and Catherine with their niece, Mary. Okay. Michael W. McArdle was born in Bailey's Harbor on October 6th, 1874. His elementary teacher, Dam Colder, gave him extra work to earn his high school diploma he graduated at 15 in 1889. He took two summer sessions of the Wisconsin Teachers Institute in Jacksonport and earned his Wisconsin teaching certificate in 1890. At 16, Michael's first teaching assignment was for two years in Sister Bay, then the Ellison Bay School for another three years. Michael then attended Oshkosh State Normal College and received a master's teaching certificate in 1893. In 1901, Michael graduated with honors after three years from the University of Wisconsin Law School in Madison and was admitted to the bar. He traveled a while after graduation and then was employed as a legal aid for the government settling land claims in the state of Montana and Washington. He briefly practiced law in Washington state before moving to Panama and working for the US government while the Panama Canal was being built. In late 1903, Michael returned to the Midwest and settled in Chicago. He worked from his room while employed as a business correspondent and salesman. His starting salary was $12 a week. He was quickly promoted to 14, then 18, then given a contract for $1,500 a year, an excellent salary for those days. In 1905, he was hired by the Flexible Shaft Company of Chicago, and they made the clipping machine that you're seeing in this picture. He began in the sales department and soon became the advertising manager. This company later became Sunbeam Corporation. From 1915 to 1925, he was the general manager of the company, and in 1927 was named president and chief executive officer of Sunbeam. Michael spent a lot of time in the engineering department where he helped design and perfect a variety of projects for the company and some of his own design. He would often bring prototypes of his brother, to his brother's family in Bailey's Harbor, and Anna, his sister-in-law, was his test kitchen, and he credited her for many of the improvements made to these products. Michael lived in Chicago and enjoyed all that it offered. He was an avid supporter of the arts, theater, and charities in the city. He made his home in an apartment at the Drake Hotel in downtown, 
but his heart always was his hometown of Bailey's Harbor. He returned often to visit his family and relax away from the busy city. On one visit home, Michael and his brother Jim sat at the kitchen table and talked about building a golf course on what had been the McArdle family farm. Michael was an avid golfer. They sketched out the course on a piece of paper, walked the property discussing the layout, and the concept of Max Elton Braze was born. Michael negotiated the purchase of the land and construction of the country club began in 1929. James was his personal representative during the construction. The building of the resort gave many local people jobs at the time, doing everything from picking stones on the fairways to laying the stone on the buildings. Excuse me. The architects were Van Holst and Elmy of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Their plan featured a Tudor-style lodge with locally quarried limestone, a tea room at the entrance known as the We Inn, five cottages situated behind the lodge on the path to the lake, tennis courts, and a garage for guests' vehicles with accommodations for their chauffeurs. The course designed by Joseph R. Rossman of Chicago opened the West Nine in 1929, and the second nine on the east side was completed in 1931. The famous 19th hole gave every guest a chance to win a medal for a hole in one when they had completed their round of golf. It was just a little chipping green. The clubhouse at Max Welton was originally open for selected members and invited guests only. A few years later, it was made available to the public. The resort name came from the Ballad of Annie Laurie. Michael especially liked the phrase, Max Welton's braids are bonnie, and chose that name for the resort. The early Max Welton brochures advertised rooms that were gaily counterpointed. A huge main lounge with beams, a massive fireplace, a raised nook overlooking Lake Michigan, and an attractive dining room, which incidentally was on the second floor. Other noted features were a first floor library stocked with current hand-picked novels, a grill room, French telephones in every room with local and long distance service available, vapor heat, and ice cold purified sterilized drinking water from the deep well. Michael's health had been failing for about 12 years. He had been diagnosed with cancer in the mid-1920s and undergone surgery at that time. In 1932, the cancer returned, and he again was under a doctor's care. By 1935, his condition had greatly deteriorated, and he realized that his time was limited. Michael's Catholic faith remained the centering of his life. He grew up attending Mass in the small white frame St. Mary's of the Lake Church in Bailey's Harbor. In 1935, his condition had worsened, and he wrote to the parishioners of St. Mary's of the Lake, telling them of his plan to provide funds for a new church building and gifting it to the community. His last months were spent going over the plans for the church with the architect, Frank Huffman of Racine, and pastor, Father Darley. It was to be a simple Italianate building with a hall and a kitchen in the basement and an adjoining parish house. The exterior was to be of limestone quarried locally. Ed Olson Construction of Sturgeon Bay was the general contractor. Henry Seiler of Bailey's Harbor directed the construction and Ferdinand Jorns of Bailey's Harbor was the stonemason. Most of the construction was carried out by local craftsmen. The church was dedicated by Bishop Paul Rohde on May 30th, 1936, a year after Michael's death. Michael W. McArdle passed away May 16th, 1935 in Chicago. He never married, but was survived at the time by two brothers, two sisters, and many nieces and nephews. The visitation was held in the clubhouse at Max Welton Bray's and his funeral was at St. Mary's of the Lake Church, officiated by Father Darley. 
Mr. McArdle is buried in the family plot at the St. Mary of the Lake Cemetery. Michael's death did not end his generosity to the town of Bailey's Harbor. His well-directed monies for construction of a town hall and library. It was to have a basement, a heating plant, and be capable of seating at least 300 people. A library room known as the McArdle Library was to be included. He also left funds for equipment and maintenance of the library. <clears throat> the exterior was to be of local limestone. The town hall and library were completed and dedicated on August 21st, 1938. And this is about how the library looked at that time, and now it's our visitor's center. Margaret McArdle, his niece, was the first librarian for the new facility. And if you look through this, um, it says they issued 109 cards for the first year of operation at the library. During Michael's illness, the doctors at the University of Wisconsin were very instrumental in his treatment. He bequeathed as well as monies as well as stock to the university for the development of the cancer laboratories at the medical school. A building known as the McArdle Memorial Cancer Research Laboratory was dedicated in 1940. In 1990, the university celebrated the 50th anniversary of the founding of the McArdle Laboratory for Cancer Research. It remains dedicated to finding a cure for cancer and patient treatment today. Michael's foresight for his community to continues to benefit all of us today. Now the sixth child of James and Nancy McArdle was John. John was born in 1875 in Bailey's Harbor. John, like his brother Michael, earned his teaching certificate and taught in several Door County schools. John would accompany the rail car loads of cattle from the local farmers to the market in St. Paul, Minnesota. While there, he met Genevieve Fitzgerald, the daughter of a buyer of cattle. He courted her, and soon they were married in South St. Paul, South Paul, Minnesota. We are told that she was a relative of the late President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. They had two daughters, Genevieve May and Elizabeth, and John passed away in St. Paul, Minnesota. The seventh child was James J., our grandfather. We'll talk about him in a minute. The eighth child was Annie, the youngest. She was born in Bailey's Harbor, April 23, 1881. She was engaged to one of the Pleck boys in the early 1900s when she was diagnosed with tuberculosis. When she learned of her illness, she broke their engagement as there was no known cure for the disease at that time. Annie passed away September 9th, 1909 at the age of 28. And she also is buried in the family plot at St. Mary's of the Lake Cemetery. Now James J, excuse me. James was born July 22nd, 1878 in Bailey's Harbor. He attended school in Bailey's Harbor, as uh, did his other siblings. Some tell the story that James' dream was to sail the lakes with Captain Bailey's ships, as they were still coming into Bailey's Harbor at that time. As his older brothers left and his father's health was failing, it was James who was charged with keeping the family farm operating. You'll see him here with two of, two of the teams that were on the farm, um, the one building to the Right, to the right is the chicken coop, and the left is the salt shed. But I don't know if you can need it. That's Ned, Beth, Lady, and Frank. <laughs> um, when his father died in 1909, Brother Michael asked James to stay on the farm to help their mother, and James agreed. Nancy, his mother, had brought in help during the time of his father's illness. The 1910 census shows Chester Bonville as a hired hand and Anna DeJardin as a servant. 
Anna de Jardin's families were among Jackson Port's French settlers in 1884. Exer and Delphine Bastien de Jardin had come from the Three Rivers, Quebec, Canada area by way of New England just after the Civil War. Land in Wisconsin was cheap, and Delphine had a brother living in Door County, so it was easy for them to settle here. Their two-story log home was just south of Jackson Port on what is now Bagnell Road. Anna was one of 16 DeJardin children. Well, it seems both James and his brother Michael were sweet on young Miss McArdle, or Miss DeJardin, I'm sorry. Michael would woo her with rides in his automobile and bring her gifts from the city. But in the end, it was James who won her affections. Rosanna DeJardin, and James Joseph McArdle were married April 10th, 1912. For reasons unknown to us, they kept their marriage secret until August of that year. James and Anna made their home with his mother on the farm as James was now in charge of its operation. They enjoyed times with the neighbors on Kangaroo Lake and this float is one from the 4th of July parade, and this was the Kangaroo Lake group. Um, Anna is on the, on the cart, and so is her uh, James' brother, Patrick. And if you look behind, uh, the team behind there is James' team coming, pulling the next float. Son James Exer was born February 12, 1913, and daughter Anna Delphine was born July 2, 1914. Anna went to her parents' home in Jacksonport to have the children. In the summer of 1915, James, Anna, and the growing family moved across the street to the former Collins home. This is the first home on North Kangaroo Lake Drive. As you turn down, it'll be on your right. On August 20th, 1816, Anna gave birth at home to twins, Mary Margaret and Joseph Thomas. Help came to stay, what? Though I just, did I say 18, I'm 18, 16, 1916, not 1816, okay. Twins were quite an event in the area at that time. They were very uncommon. Anna told of many people coming to see them and several offered to take one of them if they could not afford to raise both of them. <laughs> The babies were kept in shoe boxes close to the wood stove as they were very small at birth. Both babies thrived and Anna credited it to the Blessed Mother as she promised to keep them clothed in white for a year and to name them Mary and Joseph. Imagine at that time having two toddlers and managing to keep two infants dressed in white for a year. <laughs> Grandma Nancy's health had been failing for several years and she passed away on July 9th, 1918. James continued to manage the farm until it was sold to Mr. Kinsella to settle his mother's estate. On January 7th, 1920, the McArdles welcomed Bailey El baby Eleanor Jeanette to the family, and that spring, the family moved to town next to the Weiss brothers' garage. This is now part of Nelson's. Catherine, Catherine Lorraine was born in this house on August 8, 1921. The north side of the home served as the Olson Photography Studio until the family took over the entire house. Anna later opened a tea room in the redecorated photo studio. According to a 1928 Door County Advocate newspaper article, the interior has been remodeled and redecorated and well, will open just prior to Cherry Blossom Day. The new establishment will be known as the Harbor Tea Room. The children all attended the Bailey's Harbor Elementary School. This is a picture of the class or the children at the school in 1935. And Katie is in the top row. You see the arrow right above her head. Their home was a gathering place for the local kids. They enjoyed swimming and making rafts from driftwood to use on the waters of Lake Michigan in the summer, skating on the ponds in the winter. In this picture on the top, you'll see there's Dell and Jim and Margaret. That was about 19, 1919. 
And down here are some friends, and I don't know if you can read, that's um, in the front row is Tom, Grace Andre, and Margaret. The back row is Jimmy, Charles Andre, Dell, and Emery Oldenburg. The Bailey's Harbor Beach was always popular, and the lake gave up lots of treasures for young imaginations. And this is the bathhouse at the beach. That was in 1931. The McArdle house was always a busy place, and it was not unusual for aunts, uncles, and cousins to be around for extended times. This was the ball field, and you can just see the corner of the McArdle house at the upper left-hand side, and you're looking out over across uh, the, the harbor, and this was where the bank is now downtown. That's where the ball field was. James continued to work with Mr. Kinsella on the farm. He drove the mail truck and worked for the sawmill when they moved to town. He served on the town board and was the tax collector. He was also the general manager during the construction of Max Welton Brace and the town hall. Annie became acquainted with the wildflowers of the ridges in Bailey's Harbor through her friends Arlene Olander Betcher, a local teacher, Olivia Traven, and Emma Tuft. They often walked the area and documented the flowers they saw. Story has it that in 1936, Anna heard large machinery noise coming from the area of the, of the ridges, which was a county park. She called her friends and they investigated and found men cutting trees and filling in the slough to make a new park campground. They went to Sturgeon Bay and met with the park commissioner, Helmer Holland. The manager of the Peninsula State Park, Mr. Doolittle, was called and told to remove his men immediately from the area. Shortly after that, the Ridges Sanctuary was born, and Anna was the first secretary. <coughs> <coughs> the family was always involved in town activities. The children and their friends put on shows at Shram's Hall and charged a penny to get in. Anna and the ladies of town spent many hours cooking chicken dinners and serving them for fundraisers. Each lady would make a part of the dinner at home, and they would serve it at the old town hall. Annie was one of the original members of the Bailey's Harbor Women Club, Women's Club, which worked for beautification of the town. You can still find evidence of the rose bushes they planted if you look closely. They also participated in the 4th of July parades every year. <coughs> In 1937, the bank approached James about purchasing the Kangaroo Lake Hotel property from them. Built in 1912 by Captain J.A. Wilson and his wife Meg Collins Wilson, the property had a long history on the lake, and this is another story all to itself. It had been in foreclosure for several years, and they suggested it would be a great place for the family to live while their new home in town was being constructed. James and Anna agreed that it would be a great family property and serve their needs well. They purchased the property on June 25, 1937. No thought was ever given to operating the resort as a business, but when former guests started writing and stopping for accommodations, the family decided it might be interesting and a challenge to go into the resort business. At the time they purchased the property, it included only the lodge situated at the edge of Kangaroo Lake and a small one-bedroom log cottage and the workshop. They operated the first year as McArdle's Lodge and Cottage. <clears throat> when their new home was ready to be built, the old house was divided into two sections and moved to the resort property. The parts were remodeled and made into two two-bedroom cottages with a living room, full kitchen, and a bathroom. This is a picture of one of the cottages, and the two gentlemen in the front may be familiar to some of you. Um, the shorter one is Lee Nordgren. His family used to spend a lot of time up there. Later, James bought two cottages from Northport and also moved them onto the property, bringing the total to five cottages. The new downtown house was completed, 
and they were now open for business as Kangaroo Lake Lodge and Cottages. The lodge had nine sleeping rooms, three sleeping porches, and a central bathroom, two central bathrooms on the second floor. An office, kitchen, large dining room, and storage rooms were on the first floor. The McArdles did not serve meals at the resort, so the dining room was turned into a lounge with seating areas, card tables, a piano, and reading areas. A window sun porch opened onto the lake and a screen porch wrapped around the north end of the building. The kitchen and service rooms on the south end were the family eating and gathering areas. Each of the cottages had a lake view. There were lawn and flower beds between them and the lake. Badminton nets, croquet, fishing, swimming, outdoor chairs and hammocks for relaxing, table tennis on the lodge porch were all available to the guests. <clears throat> James purchased the Richard Nolick property to the north, which included a large two-bedroom cottage situated on the waterfront when it became available in the 1940s. And we've been told that Mr. Nolick also built the Ivanhoe, which is now um, JJ's in Jacksonport. And on the porch, uh, friends of theirs, would, they were from Chicago, friends of theirs would come to visit and they were all into the arts and their daughter was a ballerina. So we have a, a ballet bar on the porch that everybody thinks is wonderful. It kind of goes like this. So. <laughs> but, um, anyway, um, he purchased, now that the resort was complete with the lodge and six housekeeping cottages and a workshop, the McArdle family operated the resort with Anna and the girls taking care of the guests and James keeping the facilities in order. As Anna's health deteriorated, Jeanette and Katie took over running the resort. Each spring they would move from the home in town to the lake to open the resort and then reverse the process in the fall. Over the years, they hired many local people to help at the resort. Two men I remember especially that helped were Orville Becker, followed by Louis LeClaire. Each summer, two young ladies were hired to clean and to make up the rooms. They were furnished housing at the resort and a room over the workshop. Meals and uniforms. That list is long and included names I remember of Bly and Hassan Yeager and I'm sure many more, and there are a lot of these women that are still here today. During the 1960s, the popularity of the lodge was definitely down. With that and the cost of maintenance, the main lodge was torn down in 1967. A new three-bedroom home with an office was erected in its place. Interesting how today the old lodge and in concept is again popular. In 1978, Kangaroo Lake Resort was sold to the Horvaths. Cottage number one, Rippling Waters to the north, was retained by the family. In June of 1962, James and Anna celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. The whole family gathered in Bailey's Harbor for mass and a renewal of their vows in the morning. And that afternoon, they had a reception at the Florida Club. These pictures, whoop, back up one. <laughs> These are pictures that were taken that afternoon out behind the Florida Club. And this was before the building that's there now. This is the one that burned down. But there were 14 of the grandchildren there. One was in service, two were tiny babies, and one hadn't been born yet. And then the top is all the picture of the Bacardal children and their, their spouses. James McArdle was a very familiar figure around Bailey's Harbor. <clears throat> he drove his Model A pickup truck to and from the resort daily when he went to Anderson's Laundry to exchange the linens. His trips to the town dump with garbage usually resulted in him coming back with some great treasures. In the winter, he could be found with other Bailey's Harbor gents visiting in the offices of Betcher's Garage now part of the Nelson Storage Building. 
James, Anna, and the girls spent many winters enjoying the sunshine in Phoenix, Arizona. James kissed Anna goodnight on November 9, 1963, went to bed, and died peacefully in his sleep at the age of 85. He was a true Irishman and never missed dancing a jig on St. Patty's Day, a tradition we carry out in his memory. Anna's health continued to deteriorate. She had congenital heart failure and suffered from migraine headaches. She fell and broke her hip in the late 60s and battled worsening heart problems. She continued to enjoy the atmosphere at the resort and spent her last summer there in the new house. She passed away on July 13, 1975. The six McArdle children all kept in close contact with their parents in Bailey's Harbor. This picture was taken about 1937 of the family. The oldest son, James Exer, received his teaching certificate from the Door County Normal and taught in Egg Harbor for two years, then went on to receive a law degree from the University of Wisconsin in 1942. He and Charlotte Fang, Frang were married in La Crosse on April 6, 1942. He joined the FBI and was stationed in several cities across the United States, including headquarters in Washington, D.C. He retired from his last post as resident agent in La Crosse, and he and son Terry opened a law practice there. Jim passed away in 1984 and Charlotte in 1999. Jim and Char have six children. Their oldest, James Exer, who attended the Air Force Academy and retired as a lieutenant colonel, received the Mercy Murphy Air Medal for outstanding performance for that year and the Distinguished Flying Cross for 500 Vietnam missions. He's now an elementary teacher, and he and his wife Jane live in Carmichael, California. They have three children and five grandchildren. Their second son, Terry, graduated from Stout University in Menominee. He served in the U.S. Army during the Vietnam era, receiving two bronze stars and then went to law school in Washington. He later went active with the National Guard in Wisconsin, serving as the Adjutant General and retiring with the ranking of Colonel. Terry and Alita live in Stoughton, Wisconsin, and also have a home just south of Bailey's Harbor, which is the brand home that was moved out there. They have two sons and two grandchildren. Son Michael was born in St. Louis, Missouri, graduated from the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. He is an accountant. He and his wife, Mary Ann, live in, in La Crosse, have four children and seven grandchildren. Mary Ellen, or Mick, graduated from Stout University in Menominee with a bachelor's degree and later her master's. She and her partner, Gail, have a yard service in Minneapolis. Son Kevin has operated a computer management service featuring data services for the race car industry in Virginia. He's now living and working in Minneapolis. He and wife Sue have a daughter and one grandchild. Son Mark has worked for several famous organizations in the race car industry, including Richard Petty Motorsports, Penske Racing, Robert Yates Racing, Everingham Racing, and currently as Director of Competition for Furniture Row Racing. He and wife Peggy live in Denver, and they have one daughter. Jim and Anna's second child is Anna Delphine, or Del. She was born at Grandma's de Jardin's house in Jacksonport on July 2, 1914, weighing in at a whopping two pounds. She spent her first days in a cigar box on the oven door. Del graduated from Vogue College of Cosmetology in Chicago. She worked in Chicago for a while and then returned home to help the parents settle into their new home. On June 19, 1941, she married her longtime sweetheart, William Johnson. Bill grew up in Sister Bay, and he was the son of William and Wallace, William Wallace and Alice Philip Johnson. They lived in Sturgeon Bay during the war while Bill worked in the shipyards and then back to Sister Bay. Dell and Bill have three children. Bill passed away August 5, 1995, and Delphine on May 18, 2008. Their oldest daughter, Judy, was a 1960 graduate of Gibraltar High School and attended El Verno College in Milwaukee. Judy lives in Sister Bay. 
She helped establish Beanie's Restaurant, designed and sold custom clothing in several shops around the county, and is an accomplished artist. She has two children and five grandchildren. Bonnie was a 1962 graduate of Gibraltar. She and John Smith were married February 6, 1965. John is the son of Dorothy and Orrin Smith of Sister Bay. Bonnie worked for Chris Groceries in, Sturgeon, in Sister Bay until it closed, and like her mother, she does beautiful needlework of all kinds. She and John live on Flint Ridge Drive in Sister Bay. They have three sons and two grandchildren. Frederick William, or Fred, received his BS from the University of Wisconsin La Crosse, a master's from the University of Wisconsin, and a master's of fine art from the University of Wisconsin. Fred ran the famous Lake Cinema in Bailey's Harbor from 1975 to 1997. In 1973, he founded the Dragon's Breath Press and published the Door County Almanac. Fred is also a very accomplished ar artist. He recently retired from the US Post Office. Fred lives on Highway 57 in Sister Bay. The third and fourth children of James and Anna were the twins, Mary Margaret and Joseph Thomas. Thomas was born in Bailey's Harbor August, they were born in Bailey's Harbor on August 20th, 1916. They attended Bailey's Harbor Grade School and, like the others, graduated from Sturgeon Bay High School. Margaret studied a secretarial course in high school, and she was elected prom queen her junior year. She developed a rare and often fatal blood disorder shortly after graduation called purpura hemorrhagica, a disease similar to hemophilia. The specialist in Milwaukee removed her spleen and she, re she completely recovered from the condition. Orrin Hansen of Ellison Bay and Margaret had dated for many years. He was the son of Elbert and Ella Hansen. They were married on March 30th, 1940 at St. Mary's of the Lake and the reception was held in the McArdle's new home in Bailey's Harbor. <clears throat> Orrin graduated from mortuary school and worked in Sister Bay for his uncle Edwin Casperson during the war. Margaret and Orrin also operated the IGA grocery store across from the Sister Bay Town Hall. You may not recognize the building now as it's been remodeled several times and it now exists as Al Johnson's Swedish restaurant. <laughs> the young family moved to Santa Barbara for a short time then Orrin took a position in New London, Wisconsin with Klein Learman Furniture and Funeral Home and became a partner in the business, which is known today as Klein Hansen Incorporated. Orrin passed away March 27, 1967, and Marge continued to work at the furniture store until her death, July 20, 1982. They have one daughter, Christine Marie Chrissy, or Chris, that's me. <laughs> My parents lived in Sister Bay when I was born. I was born at the Door County Memorial Hospital. I graduated from Washington High School in New London in 1961, attended Stout State College in Menominee, where I met my husband, Jim Shore. We lived in Michigan for 30 years and returned to Wisconsin in 1992 after selling our business. In 2002, we, re we were repatriated to Door County and now make our home here in Bailey's Harbor. We have three daughters and 11 grandchildren. Here I am the only one with, well, I was the only child and I have the most grandchildren of all of them. So. <laughs> um, the other half of the twins, Thomas, went on to attend Lawrence University in Appleton. When war broke out, he enlisted in the United States Coast Guard. He was home on leave one day and that down at Kangaroo Lake Resort visiting his family when all of a sudden the Scanlon family from Chicago came in to visit the resort and advice from friends of theirs. Their daughter Dorothy was playing with Tom's dog King in the yard and when he found the dog and Dorothy together it was love at first sight. They were married on June 8, 1944 uh, in Chicago. When he left the service he took a job with a division of Sunbeam Corporation in Chicago. In 1948 Hot Point, a division of GE, had just opened in Milwaukee, and Tom was hired. The family lived in West Allis until they outgrew that house and then moved to Waukesha. 
In August of 1972, General Electric transferred Tom to Louisville, Kentucky, where he was the senior parts buyer for the appliance division. Tom passed away June 7, 1989, and Dorothy September 14, 2000. Tom and Dorothy were blessed with nine children, including two sets of twins. Their oldest son, Tom, uh, received his bachelor's degree from the University of Stout. This has become kind of a family tradition, you'll notice. <laughs> he worked on a broad, broad variety of management positions for Sears and Roebuck for many years. He passed away March 16, 2010, in Louisville. He was not married. Daughter Janet graduated from Waukesha High School. She and Michael Rakowicki were married in 1966, and they have three children. Michael passed away in 1998. Janet was, Janet was married to Frank Stella in 2002, and they live in Thienesville, Wisconsin. Janet has four grandchildren. Barbara Jean graduated from Waukesha High School in 1968. She and Michael Voss were married there. They have two children and two grand twins. It follows in the family. <laughs> they live in Arlington Heights, Illinois. Mary Beth and her husband, Frank Totter, Trotter, were married New Year's Eve, 1988. They have one son and live in DeForest, Wisconsin. Their first set of twins, Joan Carroll and Joseph James, uh, were born, uh, oh, I don't have their date in here. But anyway, they graduated from high school in 1972. Joan was married in Owensboro, Kentucky to John Jerkowitz. Joe went on to the University of Wisconsin and he's currently the hydraulic distribution manager for North American Technical, Ser Technical Services of Berenstein Fluid Power of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Joe and Maureen Morphy were married in Delavan, Wisconsin, August 15, 1981. They have two sons. The second set of twins, John Edward and Richard William, were born May 11, 1960 in Waukesha. John moved to New Orleans shortly after graduation, and he began working for the Water Department of the Public Service in New Orleans. He and Lisa McCall still live in the Big Easy. Richard, the other half of the twins, graduated from the University of Louisville with a degree in finance. Uh, he's currently the Vice President of State Public Affairs for United Parcel Service out of Washington, D.C. He and his wife, Kim, were married August 5, 1989, and they live in Arlington, Virginia, and have one daughter. Their last child, Robert and Leanne Duggins, were married in Louisville. Robert and Leanne still live in the family home down there, and they have two daughters. The, seventh, the fifth of the McArdle children, Eleanor Jeanette, was born January 7, 1920, in the cross across from the homestead. She attended school at the Bailey's Harbor School, high school at Sturgeon Bay, graduating in 1938. In 1936, she was elected by her junior class as prom, Queen of the May. She was a music major at Lawrence College in Appleton until the war broke out. She then went to work in the payroll office of Lathan Smith Shipyards in Sturgeon Bay. She and Laverne Maggie were featured in a Portlight newspaper story about the payroll girls touring the shipyard. She and Sister Catherine continued to help their parents operate the resort. Her mother's health was failing when the war ended, so the girls took over the operation. Jeanette was the fixer-upper. She was most comfortable in jeans with tools in hand. Jeanette was always active in the community. She belonged to the Ridges Sanctuary, Bailey's Harbor Women's Club, St. Mary's of the Lake Church Rosary Society, she was a member of the choir from a young girl until illness prevented her from attending mass. <clears throat> As a youngster, Jeanette was always the adventurer. One story stands out in particular. They didn't have money to go to the, um, to the, uh, the tent show um, as they came to town. So the kids would go and peek underneath the tent to watch the show. Seems that one of the entertainers had yellow shoes on. So after the show, Jeanette went home and painted her new shoes, bright yellow enamel. She enjoyed the company of many friends, especially where singing was involved. 
Her famous rendition of Huron Gore was a legend. She had many serious bows in her lifetime, but the timing was never right for her to marry. Her 19 nieces and nephews always felt she was a second mother, and she welcomed each of them with open arms. After the resort was sold, she and her sister Catherine would spend their summers in cottage number one. They enjoyed visiting with former guests who would always stop to visit the girls at the lake. As her health deteriorated, she was able to stay at home with the help from several special ladies who lived with them. Jeanette passed away on May 10th, 2007. Catherine Lorraine was the only child born in town. She always thought that was pretty good because she was a townie. <laughs> she arrived on August 5th, 1921. She went to elementary school in Bailey's Harbor and also graduated from Sturgeon Bay High School in 1939. She attended Whitewater State College and then the University of Wisconsin studying business. Katie returned home when the war broke out to help her parents operate Kangaroo Lake Resort. As the resort became busier, Katie was responsible for reservations and day-to-day -day operations of the resort. Their mother's health continued to fail and Katie became her primary caregiver. Katie, like her sister Jeanette, was active in her community organizations, including the Women's Club, the Ridges Sanctuary, St. Mary's Rosary and Altar Sodality, and the choir. We have several stories of Katie when she was little. One day the gypsies were in town and shopping at Brand's store. Dell was watching Katie play in the yard at the side of the house when one of the gypsies took Katie and put her on the back of their wagon. Dell ran for her mother and Anna chased them down and recovered Katie. <laughs> and she had a tendency to wander down the street and pretty soon someone would bring her back home with her clothes in one hand and Katie wrapped in a towel or a jacket in the other hand. <laughs> she had many serious relationships over the years, but she never married. Katie was the family historian. She had compiled multitudes of files on our family, other early settlers of Bailey's Harbor, the town history, St. Mary's of the Lake history, and unbelievable photos. She enjoyed writing and had several articles published in the Door County Advocate. In her later years, her health kept her from participating in many activities, but she was always there in spirit. Catherine passed away December 7, 2007. The girls, as Jenny and Katie were known, knew and were known by everyone in Bailey's Harbor and most of Door County. They kept in touch with so many folks they needed two address books. I'm sure they all have a story or two to tell about them. Guests at the resort would tell about the activities that they would organize. School friends would tell about staying at the house and the adventures that they had together. Other friends would remember sailing trips on the by gully, and former employees would tell their stories. Their 19 nieces and nephews all have wonderful memories of the aunties. They made fun for us when we visited whether it was swimming at the lake in the summer, skating at the swamp here in Bailey's Harbor in the winter, or playing dress up in the special clothes they'd saved for us. They rarely missed being present at every special occasion in our lives. Not everyone is as fortunate as we were to have not only our loving mothers, but two aunts who were also our other mothers. As they told everyone at our daughter's wedding, we are the other mothers of the bride's mother. We all miss them. Today, there are seven descendants of James and Nancy McCardle that have residences here in Bailey's Harbor. Great-granddaughter Michelle Ridings Heald and her husband own one of the first condos at Maxwell and Bray's, which was built on the original family home's land. Great-great-granddaughter Stephanie Heald Fisher and her husband Dan recently built a new house on Summit Road, not far from the town park. Great-grandson Terry McCardle and his wife, Aleda, bought the Brand home that was moved south of town. <clears throat> Permanent residents, great-great-grandson Brian Smith, who lives on North Kangaroo Lake Drive, and great-great-grandson Doug Smith, our town clerk, who lives near the town hall, 
and I am a great granddaughter. My husband Jim and I live on Solitude Lane on the buff above St. Mary's of the Lake. Our daughter Patty Hooper and her husband Paul share ownership with us in cottage number one from the original Kangaroo Lake Lodge and Cottages. Counting her children, I guess that's the sixth generation of McArdle family still here in Bailey's Harbor. <clears throat> great grand, great great grand, and great 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 grandchildren of James and Nancy Fagan McArdle with their families gather each year on the 4th of July to celebrate our family and enjoy its rich Irish history here in Bailey's Harbor. We begin with a family potluck on the 3rd, watch the parade from the downtown house, retire to the cottage on Kangaroo Lake for the afternoon, and return to the house for the fireworks. It's not unusual for 60 to 70 of us to be together. Our younger generation spend the winter texting each other to make plans for the weekend. We're thrilled that they know each other and are excited about getting together every year. The material for this story was found in the family history files collected by the late Jeanette and Catherine McArdle and Delphine McArdle Johnson, daughters of James and Anna McArdle. Thanks to Stephanie Heald, Judy Johnson, Bonnie Smith, Fred Johnson, my husband Jim and our other cousins for their help in gathering the information. I'm Chris Shore, great granddaughter of James and Nancy McArdle granddaughter of James J. and Anna DeJardin McArdle, and daughter of Orne and Marge McArdle Hansen, and wife of Jim Shore. Well, that about covers our little family. We'll all see you 4th of July downtown this year. And I thank the Bailey's His Harbor Historical Society for inviting us to share our family story with you. And thank you all for coming to hear it. And please take a look at all the things on the side when you have the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. Well, that was more than I ever thought I'd know about the McArdle family, and I thought I knew quite a bit to tell you the truth. My grandparents actually lived next door to Chris's grandparents. And so, you know, we always heard McArdle family stories with brand family stories. Um, this is pretty much the end of our program. I would ask you if you haven't signed in you know our little attendance sheet please do that before you leave and if you are a member no you don't have to write your whole address and phone number and everything just just say member and we'll, we'll we know who you are um i think the only thing re remaining is for us to have our drawing for the dvd is there anybody who would like to register for that that hasn't had an opportunity so we don't want any unhappy people going home I guess not. Well, then we should be all set. Do you have your, t your little tags there, Christy? And in case you're wondering about this little container, this is the hat box for the top hat by the little donations thing. Well, I'm not going to pick this out of here. Hmm. If I hold it up high, I'm going to need somebody tall. Doug, how about you? Okay, no peeking? Okay, I guarantee that was completely honest. <laughs> and the lucky winner is Dolly Zahn. Okay, Dolly, um, we have, you have the four DVDs to select one from, from our last season. I guess it's a season, yeah. So congratulations. This was kind of a last minute idea and uh, seems like it's quite kind of fun. Our next presentation is the 9th of June um, when we will take a look at the Crovis Farm and Orchards. They've been working on it over the winter and um, it sounds like it might be kind of fun. And thank you so much. You know, this has just been a testament to what two immigrant people who come here with just almost nothing can build in America. I think it's just a terrific story. Thank you all so much. <laughs>